Hey y'all, I wanted to read a bit here from Ronald Weitzer, He's a sociologist, this is from reading from Wiki here, is a sociologist specializing in criminology and a professor at George Washington University, known for his publications on police minority relations and the sex industry. This is a paper written here, uh, The Social Construction of Sex Trafficking, Ideology and Institutionalization of a Moral Crusade. In the social con- constructionist perspective, social conditions become problems only as a result of claims making by interested parties. Claims that may or may not reflect actual social arrangements. Claims about putative conditions are more consequential than the conditions themselves. Moral crusades are one of the forces responsible for transforming such conditions into problems. These movements define a particular condition as an unqualified evil and see their mission as a righteous enterprise whose goals are both symbolic attempting to redraw or bolster normative boundaries and moral standards and instrumental providing relief to victims punishing evildoers to achieve their aims activists seek to generate widespread public concern about a problem and lobby political elites to either intensify punishment of offenders or criminalize acts that were previously legal. Moral crusades advance claims about both the gravity and incidence of a particular problem. They typically rely on horror stories and atrocity tales about victims in which the most shocking exemplars of victimization are described and typified casting the problem in highly dramatic terms by recounting the plight of highly traumatized victims is intended to alarm the public and policymakers and justify draconian solutions. At the same time, inflated claims are made about the magnitude of the problem. A key feature of many moral crusades is that the imputed scale of a problem, ergo the number of victims, far exceeds what is warranted by the available evidence. Moreover, crusade leaders consider the problem unambiguous. They are not inclined to acknowledge gray areas and are adamant that a particular evil exists precisely as they depict it. A number of studies have examined the claims and activities of various moral crusades and the larger issues of how social problems are constructed, but much less attention has been devoted to the impact of crusade claims on public perceptions of social problems or the dynamics of institutionalization in state policies. Here, identify and evaluate the core claims of dominant forces in the anti-trafficking campaign and then trace the incorporation of these claims in state policy in the United States. The article is based on an analysis of activists' pronouncements, movement documents, publications of government agencies, and relevant legislation. So now he goes into organizations involved. Two decades ago, a coalition of the religious right and some radical feminists launched a major campaign against pornography. These groups played a predominant role in some municipal campaigns to ban pornography and, at the national level, in the Reagan administration's Commission on Pornography, headed by Attorney General Edwin Meese. The Commission's recommendations relied heavily on the testimony of leading anti-pornography activists, privileged their claims regarding the various harms of pornography, ergo causing violence against women, moral decline, and dismissed counter-evidence. The Justice Department formally accepted and implemented the Commission's recommendations, including the creation of a new obscenity unit within the agency. In a resulting crackdown on pornography, the Department launched an unprecedented number of obscenity prosecutions, resulting in huge fines that bankrupted several distributions and forced others to terminate sales in conservative areas of the country. A remarkably similar alliance of the religious right, abolitionist feminists, and the U.S. government is occurring today. The inauguration of President George W. Bush in 2001 significantly altered the political opportunity structure for anti-prostitution forces, providing a degree of access and influence that had not existed since the Reagan administration two decades earlier. On the right, crusade members included focus on the family 
National Association of Evangelicals, Catholic Bishops Conference, Traditional Values Coalition, Concerned Women for America, Salvation Army, International Justice Mission, Shared Hope International, Religious Freedom Coalition, and numerous others. The premier abolitionist feminist organization in the United States is the Coalition Against Trafficking in Women, C-A-T-W. Others include Equality Now, The Protection Project, and Standing Against Global Exploitation. Members of these conservative religious and feminist groups hold opposing views on other social issues, such as abortion and same-sex marriage, but they largely agree on prostitution and pornography. The single-issue focus of most of these feminist groups, targeting the sex industry exclusively, trumps all other issues and facilitates their willingness to work with the right-wing groups. The same dynamic characterized radical feminist involvement in the anti-porn coalition of the mid-1980s. The partners in this alliance clearly recognized the strategic advantages of coalition work in enhancing the legitimacy of their campaign as a bipartisan an enterprise. The advantages of a united front are outlined by two prominent activists. The feminists have been hampered in their response to this threat because there are divisions within feminism about the nature of prostitution. Feminists should stop demonizing the conservative and faith-based groups that could be better allies on some issues than the liberal left has been. Saving lives and defending freedom are more important than loyalty to an outdated and too limited feminist sisterhood. Another leader describes the benefits of this alliance, quote, having faith-based groups come in with a fresh perspective and a biblical mandate has made a big difference, end quote. In that abolitionist feminists, in that abolitionist feminists, quote, would not be getting attention internationally otherwise, end quote. Regarding President Bush, activist Donna Hughes remarks, quote, mainstream feminists like to say he's anti-woman, but by supporting the abolitionist work against the global sex trade, he has done more for women and girls than any other president I can think of. Years from now, when the anti-Bush hysteria has died away, I believe he will be recognized as a true advocate for women's freedom and human rights. Abolitionist feminists refers to those who argue that the sex industry should be entirely eliminated because of its objectification and oppressive treatment of women considered to be inherent in the sale of sex. In the next section, I critically evaluate the claims made by activists in this camp regarding both sex trafficking and prostitution more generally. Here, it is important to note that mainstream feminist organizations have been far less active in this debate and have now been overshadowed by abolitionists. The premier women's rights organization now makes no mention on its website of sex trafficking, prostitution, or pornography though it did pass a resolution endorsing the decriminalization of prostitution in 1973. Another mainstream association, the National Council of Women's Organizations, is also silent on these issues, though its website does provide a link on trafficking to a member group, Vital Voices. Because the debate over sex work has been so divisive in the past, and members continue to disagree, it is not surprising that organizations not directly involved with this issue would avoid it altogether. The Crusade's claims have been challenged by other feminists and by other groups. In academia, a number of prominent feminists have been involved in a long-standing, heated debate with abolitionists over pornography and prostitution. Among the groups that stand opposed to the current anti-prostitution campaign are the Network of Sex Work Projects, a coalition of 40 international groups, the Sex Workers Outreach Project, the Global Alliance Against Trafficking in Women, and the Sex Workers Project in New York. These organizations conduct research on trafficking and or provide assistance to individuals involved in sex work, but they do not condemn sex work per se. Their primary concern is the empowerment of workers and harm reduction via provision of condoms, counseling, and other support services. Because they reject abolitionism, they have been increasingly marginalized and dismissed as the, quote, pro-prostitution lobby, end quote, in the discourse of the preeminent anti-trafficking forces. 
These groups, like American sex workers' rights groups are more generally, have virtually no access to state elites. The moral crusade under examination here has increasingly dominated the debate. Claim 1. Prostitution is evil by definition. For abolitionist feminist, prostitution is inherently an institution of male domination and exploitation of women. CATW's website proclaims, quote, All prostitution exploits women regardless of women's consent. Prostitution affects all women, justifies the sale of any woman, and reduces all women to sex, end quote. Claim 2. Violence is omnipresent in prostitution and sex trafficking. It is not simply that violent incidents occur. Instead, prostitution is a form of violence, categorically and universally. CATW co-director Janice Raymond writes, quote, To understand how violence is intrinsic to prostitution, it is necessary to understand the sex of prostitution. The sexual service provided in prostitution is most often violent, degrading, and abusive sexual acts, and sex trafficking is similarly defined as involving coercion of some kind, physical or otherwise. As discussed further below, anti-prostitution activists have consistently tried to erase the distinction between coercive trafficking and voluntary migration, and insist that victimization is the hallmark of all trafficking and prostitution. Claim 3. Customers and traffickers are the personification of evil. As in other moral crusades, the perpetrators are presented as folk devils. Customers are labeled sexual predators that brutalize women. Claim 4. Sex workers lack agency. The denial of agency is evident in the very framing of the problem as one involving prostituted women, trafficking, and sexual slavery. The central claim is that workers do not actively make choices to enter or remain in prostitution, and there is no such thing as voluntary migration for the purpose of sex work. The notion of consent is deemed irrelevant, and activists have pressed governments to criminalize all such migration, whether consensual or not. Quote, legislation must not allow traffickers to use the consent of the victim as a defense against trafficking, end quote, argue Raymond and Hughes. Claim 5. Prostitution and sex trafficking are inextricably linked. Activists in, the, in this crusade insist that prostitution must be targeted because it is prostitution more than anything else that is the root cause of trafficking. Opposing trafficking without simultaneously fighting prostitution is seen as treating the symptom instead of the disease. The conflation of trafficking and prostitution is motivated by the crusade's ultimate goal of eliminating the entire sex trade, a goal that is frequently articulated. Donnie Hughes, for example, calls for, quote, relinking trafficking and prostitution and combating the commercial sex trade as a whole, end quote. Not only does she equate the two, quote, sex trafficking of women and children, what's commonly called prostitution, end quote, but she also claims that most sex workers are or originally started out as trafficked women and girls. The research literature does not support this claim. There is no evidence that most, or even the majority of prostitutes, have been trafficked. Moreover, prostitution and trafficking differ substantively. The former is a type of work, and the latter is a means of accessing a new market. Both empirically and conceptually, it is inappropriate to fuse prostitution and trafficking. Claim 6. The magnitude of both prostitution and sex trafficking is high and has greatly increased in recent years. The size of a social problem matters in attracting media coverage, donor funding, and attention from policymakers. Moral crusades, therefore, have an interest in inflating the magnitude of the problem, and their figures are typically unverifiable and or incredibly elastic. This is a staple of the anti-trafficking crusade. 